TGRT Gaming Podcast, episode 700, recorded on October 17th, 2023. Hello, and welcome to the 700th edition of the TV Gaming Podcast, Big 700. And 533rd episode of Video Game Roundtable. I am TJ Denzer. I am Scott Durr. And I am Jonah Falcon. The VGRT Gaming Podcast focuses on game news from around the industry. Yeah, it's a pity our 700th episode is going to be about boring topics that no one really cares about. I mean, it's just like, you could have had more interesting things to talk about on the 700th episode. But um, we can talk about uh, what we've been playing. Uh, TJ, what have you been playing? I have been back on the Guilty Gear grind. Um, okay. They put out a new character last month, uh, Johnny. Uh, he is a – he's kind of like a prototypical American cowboy type, but he uses a uh, a cane sword, and uh, he's got a lot of flash and style to him. He's also been like one of my favorite characters to play in the game since it came out. Uh, he has a gimmick mm-hmm. where he throws a card that by itself doesn't do any damage, but he has another attack where he swings his sword in like an instant and, and, and he can do it either downward diagonal, upward diagonal or straight ahead. And if he cuts that card in midair while it's, uh, while it's out there, uh, he will not only hit his opponent with uh, the sword, but the card will explode and launch them into the air. So he's got a lot of interesting setups where he can really put some mean pressure on enemies. And uh, I've been uh, I've been training my ass off with him and trying to get to the the highest rank of uh, Guilty Gear with him. I'm I'm like I'm really close and I'm having some of the most fun I've had with the game for a while. How about you, Scott? I have been playing uh, Minecraft and just enjoying. Yeah, building stuff in there, and I guess nothing new. But I've been uh, I've been watching some games that have been coming out. I know uh, Star Ocean Two uh, remake is coming out soon, so I'm looking forward to that game. So speaking of Minecraft, Minecraft Live just aired this past weekend. Oh yeah. And um, from what I understand, you know, there's a lot of people disappointed that Armod- Armadillo won. I did want the crab for further arm reach um, for the blocks, uh, but it's it's fine because, you know, dog armor does sound nice and you get to decorate your doggy and probably put all different color armor on. And I'm sure they'll make it interesting and fun for those that want to have their decorated armored dog in, in battle with them. Yeah, there's been a, a justice for crab uh, movement going on right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, the thing is that these uh, the loser ones don't get thrown away. They get put no. into the idea library, and if they uh, feel right, they'll use them. Like the frog. Yeah, everybody has a frog hat now. What is that? The frog hat. Well, anyways, uh, the frog uh, got added in the swamp update, even though it previously lost before so um with this update they're they're uh they're they're using the tough blocks to be carved blocks and bricks and they're also doing the same with copper adding more stuff like copper lights so people are wondering if the tough golem or copper golem will be put into this update because it seems to be all about tinkering and going on adventures so that might be something to that we could see in the game if they they, if they if they felt like it, so yeah, that's what I'm hoping for. They also added the Star Wars DLC, which is going to be during the Clone Wars. You get uh, mm-hmm. Grandmaster Yoda, Mace Windu, and some other Jedi. Um, they also and, have a Dungeons and Dragons one too, which I like too. Yeah, they also have the Planet Earth three DLC, uh, which is a collaboration with BBC. So you'll have that. I have even more animals to deal with, and also they are. Um, Saying get ready for the 15th anniversary next year. Oh, yeah. I don't know what will happen during that. Yeah, but I guess they have something planned, some sort of celebration of some kind. Yeah. Um, there have been 300 million copies of Minecraft sold. And that's just yeah. us. That's just that us. That is. That is. 
Um, I just saw a video in which these people who are like 10 when they first started playing Minecraft, they're, you know, in their mid 20s now, and they talk about how it grew up with them. You're not that young, but um, what's it like playing Minecraft from the start and, you know, like 14, 15 years later, and your situation has changed? I think it's interesting because, like, the game has evolved and changed, and they have added so many things. I joined when they were adding villages. They hadn't even implemented the villagers yet. And it was just amazing because all the things they add, like enchanting and the beacons and the elytra, really just continued to change the game every single time. Made it more fun, made it more expansive. Just you could do more things, get more blocks, more decorative stuff. And they would evolve the different biomes and add different mobs. And it's just a completely different game than when it started. Yeah, they just added the trial chamber. Have you tried that yet? No, because they, it's not in the snapshots, but it, it should be coming out soon. Okay. I, I mean, I saw them play uh, doing the demo for that. Yeah. The, the, the gust, the breeze looks pretty interesting. It's like a little hurricane tornado that goes around blowing you around the room and shoots air. Yeah, but you also have to get all these objects and you have to avoid mm-hmm. traps and stuff like that. Yeah. Anyway. The, yeah. Yeah. As for me, um, I do not like Assassin's Creed Mirage for only one reason, and that is the combat is just awful. The combat is really, really bad, and it brings the rest of the game down with it. And I was starting to enjoy it a lot because it was like going back to the first Assassin's Creed a lot, you know? You do your assassin. The one thing that I don't like is that um, in Assassin's Creed and 2 or whatever, you know, when you did your assassination, you had to get the hell out of here. You had to find a way to avoid the uh, guards and find a way to hide and, and lose them. And sometimes... It was like 30 minutes of running and and trying to hide. I didn't have to do that after my assassination, Assassin's Creed Mirage. I wish that the original Assassin's Creed just had really a one button uh, combat, which worked well for it. You know, you still wouldn't hold up if you were in a crowd. But in this, you know, if you have three people attacking you, that's it. It's over. You lose. So I, I sent it back. And I can't play it. Um, I will say this. Uh, I did download Forza, but I haven't played it yet. So we'll see about that. And I've started a new game uh, called Fights in Tight Spaces. Have you seen this game? No, I have not. I have. That's uh, It's like a card battler, but it's martial arts, right? Yeah, it's basically cool. Slay the Spire meets John Wick. Yeah. It's really fun. Um, I've gotten past one level, and I'm in the middle of the other one. And, uh, you know, you unlock different types of things. Like, you could have a normal mode, or you can have a counter mode, or you can have a gun mode in which, you know, you pull out your gun and then put it back and all that stuff. And um, it looks like John Wick Hex, too. It has that um, – uh, what was the name of that game in which everything is going in super slow motion – you know the game I'm talking about, which everybody um, is read. It's a uh, super hot. Yeah, it's like super hot, except it's turn based and with Slay the Spire cards. It's really fun. It's really inexpensive. It's only a, a 25 buck game. And if you want something like Slay the Spire, I'd say try it out. I've also been doing Monster Train too, so it's another Slay the Spire type game in which it's a card, you know, roguelike. Not quite as good as Fights in Tight Spaces, but it's fun. Um, I found out uh, about Agatha Christie's Murder on the Orient Express, which I'm looking for. It's going to come out at the end of the year, too. That's really weird. But apparently um, it's, it takes place in the modern day, and it's inspired by the, uh, by the thing. You still play as Hercule Poirot, but you also have a second detective in another location, so it's sort of like shifts between the two detectives. So I'm, I'm definitely pre-ordering that. Uh, I enjoyed the previous, uh, EQ Poirot game by these people. I was irritated the heck by the Poirot they used cause he was thin and very, very young. It's like the beginning of his career, but it was fine for what it was. Um, 
I'm still play I'm still trying to play uh, Sherlock Holmes Chapter One, but I keep on getting distracted from it. But yeah, um, there's also a game coming out that's a lot like Mist. I forgot the name of it, and I was thinking, you know what, Scott would love this game. For for a moment, I think it's called. No, no, it's a longer name. It's some long ass name. I'll figure it out a little bit later. But it's uh, it looks interesting. Okay. So um, we're gonna move on to quick news. And this one I know TJ will love. Uh, Power Hungry Baldur's Gate 3 player stacks Karlak with enlargement magic until she's a 20-foot tall, 5-ton giantess who could kill a dragon by stomping on it. So um, there's a there's a uh, there's an elixir which actually you know gives you super strength or something like that. And then you can make uh, you have a spell that makes them grow. So this person just spammed it until she's like towering over everybody. <laughs> have you seen it? I know those spells, and like I never even considered stacking them that hard. That sounds ridiculous. <laughs> it is ridiculous. <laughs> it is just actually no. The game that I'm thinking of is sort of like Seventh Guest, not Mist. Oh, okay. I have to find out what that game is. Anyways, um, so yeah, uh, the thing that we've been uh, waiting for has finally happened after 20 months. Seems like forever. Uh, Microsoft closes $69 billion acquisition of Activision Blizzard from CNBC, and it actually happened on the day that we recorded our last episode. Um, Microsoft has closed its $69 billion acquisition of a video game publisher, Activision Blizzard, according to the regulatory filing by the company on Friday. It's Microsoft's largest deal in its 48-year history and comes after the company quelled concerns about from competition from UK and European regulators and gained a favorable, favorable ruling from a U.S. district judge. By the way, I think the second biggest acquisition they ever did, they ever did was like $48 billion for LinkedIn, something like that. I, th- I think LinkedIn was their other biggest acquisition. Uh, the UK CMA gave its nod to the deal earlier Friday, clearing the way for the close, and they were very self-congratulatory, but they were saving face. It was all bullshit. It's like they were backed into a corner and they had to accept. Said, oh, yeah, we're going to use Ubisoft? That's fine. Yeah, just just close this. Because it's like a UK judge had to tell him, wait a minute, you can't just close it right now. You have to do some stuff. And it's like, see, oh, do we really have to? Uh, the deal was announced in January 2022, which gives Microsoft a hefty, hefty portfolio of video game franchises, including Call of Duty, Crash Bandicoot, Diablo, Overwatch, StarCraft, Tony Hawk, Pro Skater, and Warcraft. Uh, the game developer generated $7.5 billion in revenue in its light fiscal year. A small fraction of the 12, uh, 212 billion in sales reeled in by Microsoft. Uh, today we start working we're to bring in beloved Activision, K- uh, Blizzard, and King franchises to Game Pass and other platforms. Microsoft Gaming CEO Phil Spencer said in a blog post, "We'll share more about this when you can when you can expect to play in the coming months." Um, Activision Blizzard CEO Bobby Kotick will stay as CEO through the end of the year. He's out on December 31st with his 400 million dollar golden parachute. I wish I could fail that hard. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella, who took the helm in 2014, is aiming to diversify the company's business beyond its core areas, such as OSs and productivity software. Um, they neglect to mention that Microsoft's biggest business right now is cloud serving, service, servers. Um, Activision has both been a, both a partner to Microsoft and a competitor. Uh, why would you say it that way, CNBC? And a competitor. Yeah, uh, they're called Sony. It's one of the few large companies that releases popular games that can cost hundreds of millions of dollars to produce. Uh, regulatory pushback delayed the acquisition when the deal was announced in January 2022. Microsoft has said it expected to close the transaction by the end of June 2023. In July, the two companies agreed to extend the uh, deadline to October 18th. Uh, it was closed on October 13th. Uh, the FTC in the U.S., U- European Commission, and the U.K.'s Competition and Markets Authority all raised ob- objections to the transaction. Microsoft made concessions that placated U- European regulators. The company agreed to give consumers in the EU free licenses to stream their Activision Blizzard games, along with free licenses to streaming providers so European gamers could play the games through the cloud. Microsoft uh, signed agreements with console rivals Nintendo and Sony, promising them all access to Call of Duty for the next 10 years. And Microsoft made similar arrangements with cloud uh, gaming providers, including Boosteroid, NVIDIA, Enware, and Ubitus. Uh, those are all in Europe. Uh, the FTC in July asked the San Francisco Federal uh, District uh, Court for a preliminary injunction to stop Microsoft and Activision from closing their deal before receiving full approval. But after five days of hearings, a judge sided with the two companies. 
the agency took the case to the US, USA Appeals Court for the Ninth Circuit, which denied a motion to temporarily stop the consummation of the deal. Satisfying UK officials was more complicated. In August, Microsoft said that, assuming the deal closed, game publisher Ubisoft would receive cloud uh, streaming rights for Activision's games for 15 years. That's interesting. I thought it was just all of Microsoft's cloud. No. It's just for Activision's games for 15 years. That's interesting. The FTC said Friday still has concerns, but they can just sit and spin because no one's going to listen to them anymore. They're done. Uh, they are, the Ninth Circuit said no, and I doubt a per, uh, the judge within FTC will say, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, this is a long time in coming. Finally, this is a story that would not end, and it's finally over. Yeah, this, uh, <laughs> I mean, this has been a long time coming, I guess. I, there's been so much back and forth. We've been talking about this for years now. So many, uh, so many setbacks. So Almost many two years, things. Jesus. And uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm still not crazy about consolidation, but it's happening. I mean... It's uh, it's going to be interesting to see what Microsoft does with it now that they have it, because uh, Phil Spencer, one of the things that interested me about what he said was that the the difference between this and Bethesda was that the regulatory process of this deal was so much lengthier than Bethesda that it basically kept them from being able to work with Activision Blizzard and integrate like into their programs like game pass uh, the other thing is they, that uh, when they, they close yeah when they acquired bethesda also the pandemic hit so they are sort of forced to put all their games immediately on game pass we'll be getting to that though but uh yeah oh i see um but got a little bit ahead of myself but at the same time like it's it's interesting to think about that like this th- their their hands have been kind of tied trying to make sure that like all the regulatory bodies that needed that had concerns about this deal they uh they met them on every front and and satisfied every every condition that they were required to meet. So I still don't understand what the what the FTC was doing. I seriously don't. It's one thing to be nervous because here's the thing. Um they're probably still stinging over the fact that they didn't get to Microsoft and Windows when it was starting. They had they, they didn't see it dominating the, the PC industry. Um, you can say, well, you know, there's also Apple and, and Linux, you know, and Apple has a good chunk of it, but still. Um, but, yeah, it seems like they were really desperate, and they acted so much like Sony's agent, you have to wonder. Because one of the things that the judge said was, after the ruling was, well, it's not good for Sony, but it's good for the consumer. We're not here to uh, to help Sony, who is the market leader in this area. It's awfully strange for the uh, for a consumer advocate to be siding with the market leader who has 42 percent share. Yeah. <clears throat> and I'm not saying that like and I wouldn't say that like Microsoft or Xbox are, are bad guys at all. I'm just but uh... no, I get that. It makes a lot of people nervous to have, you know, all of this under one roof. But the thing is that this is vertical. Uh, integration. It's not horizontal. And um, I watched a lawyer talking about this. And the thing is that this is a vertical inter- integration. It's not making Microsoft bigger. It's making them have more. But it's it, here's the thing. If Microsoft bought Nintendo, that would be a monopoly. That would yeah. be a monopoly because that is horizontal uh, you know, integration. You're getting more of the piece. But the thing is that Sony's at 42, Nintendo's at 28, and Microsoft's at 27 – you know, them getting all these developers doesn't make them dominate the market. It just gives them more. And I think here's the thing about them, two things about this. One, this is, all, this is partially all about Game Pass because now they have a crap ton more games, even if they're going to have to wait for it. There are a lot of people who are just waiting for all the old Call of Duty games to be put on Game Pass. They're just – they're already backwards compatible and people are still playing online, but, you know – have access to all of them from the first Call of Duty on up. And I don't play online, but I, I, I do want to play the single player. I will say this, and this is one of my secret chains. I did not play Call of Duty 4, Modern Warfare. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, the, the the Modern Warfare games, especially the remakes, have been. Uh, I mean, they're still Call of Duty. They're still like basically the the thing that Activision spends on all its money on making pretty much every other year or so. And uh, I would say that like the main thing that keeps me from playing Call of Duty is a I don't want to give money to Activision Blizzard, and b uh, they. Uh, the the file size is 250 gigabytes, which I don't feel like putting that kind of uh, file on my hard drive when I could. That's so many other games I could be playing. That well, hey, there's streaming now. If you're playing a single player, who cares if you, there's a little bit of lag, you know? Call of Duty, like they straight up leaned into the idea that Call of Duty is the only game that a Call of Duty fan plays. Yeah, but here's <laughs> a- I don't think. I don't think they're entirely wrong about that because yeah. the people that I know play, that play Call of Duty and care a lot about it don't play many other things. <laughs> yeah, they they were smart to turn Call of Duty into a live service game now. Um, well, here's the thing that you'll make you say, oh, okay, I'm okay with playing. Microsoft also, um, A, has the uh, – they don't stand for toxic workplaces – they will clean that shit up. They they haven't they haven't stood for it since 1990. They're they're the first major company to have same sex uh you know partner uh, uh benefits, and um, they have an HR program that's going to make sure that no hanky panky is going around. So you can don't have to worry about the toxic environment there anymore. And Microsoft said last year that they were not going to stand in the way of Blizzard unionizing. So. Right off the bat, it's going to be a lot better to work at Activision Blizzard King. The other thing is that um, people still don't uh, understand. One of the biggest things about this deal for Microsoft was King, because they make billion uh, over a billion dollars with their mobile games. It is a cash cow, and there isn't much revenue you have to put. You don't have to put much investment into it. It just prints money. Candy Crush and et al. These 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 mobile games make a lot a lot of money. There are a lot of people I've met literally around the world who tell me, even if they don't play games, they have at least spent a little bit of time with Candy Crush and a little bit of money. It, apparently, <laughs> it's, it's so uh, relevant if I say I spent zero time with Candy Crush. <laughs> that's yeah, that's not the only game that King makes. They just they have a wide yeah. portfolio, but Candy Crush is the face of that part. Sure. And like that, all I'm saying is that like the, there is it is it is one of the most easily understandable things. And even if you don't like That's it, it's, like, it's it's a free to play game. So like whether you play it or not, you didn't you don't have to spend a dime on it. I don't think I've ever spent a dollar on Candy Crush. I have played the game and I've fiddled with it a lot, especially on airplanes. It's a good airplane game. Yeah. I had a lot of. uh of those kind of casual games on my cell when I, when I had an iPod touch. Uh, for, so I see for some reason I've stopped playing those kind of games on Android, or maybe it's just, I've stopped playing them and I just happen to have an Android now. Um, the other thing is that, Oh boy, I lost my, my train of thought here. So yeah. Um, but yeah, now I remember, uh, <laughs> the other thing that we have to understand is that now, um, it's not going to be, it's not going to be, it's not going to be on Game Pass anytime soon. We'll get into that. But now, um, Microsoft gets a chunk of all the sales of Call of Duty on PlayStation and PC and Nintendo. As you know, I don't know many people who play Call of Duty on, on a Switch, but those that do will be. So all this, this other money is going into Microsoft's pocket too. They were not going to spend almost $70 billion dollars without expecting to make that money back. Hmm. Yeah, that's fair. And like, they now have a mountain of IP to deal with. And Phil Spencer seems like he's pretty intent on uh, letting folks make passion projects if they care about something in Activision Blizzard's library. Yeah, actually, that's a good segue. Phil Spencer, Activision Blizzard games not coming to Game Pass until 2024. And this comes from Neowin. Uh, it was actually a, a video that was released like, an hour ago on YouTube by Xbox. In the latest video edition of the official Xbox podcast, Spencer admitted that after Microsoft closed the deal to buy Bethesda Softworks in 2021, 
A number of its games got quickly got put on Xbox Games Pass. However, that won't be the case with Activision Blizzard, he stated. The truth of the matter is, with Bl- Activision Blizzard King, that the regulatory process took so long, and finally there was a lot of uncertainty in the process, uh, in that process up to really a week before we closed, or the week of when the CMA finally came down to the decision that we weren't able to get in and work with the mostly Activision and Blizzard in this case on that back catalog work. Now that the deal is closed, we're starting that work, but there is work. Spencer stated that the Activision Blizzard statement last week that we would see its titles on Game Pass in 2024 is accurate. He added, I would love it if there was some secret celebration drop that's coming in the next couple of weeks. There's not. And I think he's referring to that uh, that image of um, the list of all the old Call of Duty games from Call of Duty 1 to Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 reboot that um, was next to the Game Pass logo. He said, no, that's not happening yet. Uh, Spencer admitted uh, that not being able to quickly add its newly acquired games on Xbox Game Pass immediately is a little bit of a downer, but I'm excited about the future. And I just want to be straight with people. That's what where we are. He also talked, and this is going to please Scott a lot. <laughs> he also talked about some of the game franchises he would like people to rediscover, like the Infocom text adventures like Zork or games from the Sierra catalog like King's Quest. He stated, just because of my age, those things speak to me. Because there are moments in my gaming career, my gaming experience, that really meant something, and I love those. I really hope that that uh, he means that, and he's really going to put effort into bringing these franchises back, and maybe even having Ken and Roberta work as, I don't know, independent uh, contractors or something, because I know they have Sajinus games going. Yeah. And, um, you know, all the other IPs like uh, Space Quest and... uh, Please Quest, Quest for Glory, and and Gabriel Knight. There's just so many, and uh, yeah, that was a big part of my childhood as well. So just hearing that just is like, oh, please, please be true. You know, that's what I've been waiting this whole entire time for this whole merger. It's like, you know, if they could just bring these games back, that'd be great. Spencer also said he was going to be playing Spider-Man Two and uh, Baldur's Gate Three. Yeah, I. Uh... <clears throat> I would love to see something like Gabriel Knight make a return. I, I actually just finished watching a playthrough of the – I forget which one it was. I think it was the second game. That was and Beast Within? Maybe. I don't know. It might have just been the first game, but like a, an updated version of it. But either way, those games are fun. Like all, Most of Roberta Williams' stuff is incredible. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and we just saw the remake of the Seventh Guest, so we're in a time where like we we've had remakes of the Seventh Guest of Colossal Ca- Colossal Cave mm-hmm. of 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 uh, there been a uh, Mist right. and the guys that made Mist are making new games. It's kind of a uh, it's kind of a renaissance of of old head adventure games. Well, well I mean, we had uh, Sea of Stars being like Chrono Trigger and Iudian Chronicle being like Sukaden. So there's there's been a lot of it. Yeah, uh, the game I was referring to before, Scott, was The Inheritance of Crimson Manor. Okay. It actually already came out um, on on Steam, which is uh, it's $20 on Steam right now. Um, the, it's uh, any game by uh, Media City Games, and it's their... Um, they did um, Alice Trap Beyond Wonderland was their first game. So yeah, if you wanna if you want a seventh guest type game right now, you should try uh, the Inheritance of Crimson Manor. I'll look that up. Yeah, it came out last year, oh, okay. and it's finally it's finally coming to console now, which is why it, it, it went on my radar. Okay. So. Oh yeah, I see what you mean. Definitely. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a seventh guest type game, and mm-hmm. if you want to try something that's seven guest dish that's gotten a lot of uh, positive reviews. Check it out. It's only twenty bucks. Anyways, yeah, that's good. TJ, next item. Alrighty. Okay. Are we on uh, City Skylines? Mm-hmm. All right. City Skylines Two performance has not achieved the benchmark Paradox Interactive targeted. From Game Watcher. As City Skylines 2's PC launch approaches, publisher Paradox Interactive has issued a statement on the game's performance in an effort to address growing concerns from its fan base. City Skylines 2, 2's performance became a hot topic among players after the sequel's system requirements were raised relatively close to launch. 
Unfortunately, while the net game's next gen nature does play a role in its demand in its uh, more demanding recent PC specs, other challenges seem to have made getting there where it needs to be more difficult than expected. Um, Let's just say the system specs are not very low. Uh, yeah, you have the, yeah. you have a, you need a Ryzen five for the minimum for the Ryzen five. You need eight gigabytes of RAM. You need at least a GTX a, a 970 four gigabyte or the AMD equivalent. Uh, you need and you need four gigabyte uh, four megabytes of video RAM. The recommended requirements you need at least a, a Ryzen seven or an Intel Core i five 16 gigabytes of RAM. A 3080 uh, 10 gigabyte video card or AMD equivalent, and 10 megabytes of uh, uh, video RAM. So it's, it's kind of hefty. Yeah, and uh, pa- Paradox would go on to say that it hasn't shared how well or poorly the, the title is expected to run, but has determined a few graphic settings that have minimal impact on the player experience, but increased performance significantly. Details about them are expected shortly, so hopefully it won't be too long until we're equipped with at least a few tools to make the title run smoother, should we run into issues. Yeah, so um, just so you know, uh, we're recording this on the 17th, and it's due to come out next week on the 24th on PC. Oh, by the way, I don't know if we covered this, but um, I think we did. The console version ain't coming out until April. (sighs) Yeah, and uh, bummer, I would love to play this on uh, PS5, but uh, at the same time, I would kind of rather wait until they like smooth out all the uh, the early issues, and uh, hopefully it'll be good by the time that uh, it makes it its way over to consoles. I, and I don't mean like that. That's a bad way of putting it. I don't mean like it won't be bad, but at the same time, like this game is gonna be a resource hog, and uh, I have no doubt that we're gonna see some frustration in the early days of uh, the launch as they figure out where they need to optimize. You might as well take the next item since it's related. Um, City Skylines, this one is a perplexing one. Uh, City Skylines 2 won't use Steam Workshop for mod sharing from PC Gamer. In a post on its forums today, Paradox Interactive said that the official mod dis- distribution channel for City Skylines will be Paradox Mods, its custom cross-platform mod library. And a related fact, it said that uh, that Steam Workshop won't be supported. Steam Workshop is a convenient way to find and install mods, but the new platform does have the advantage of allowing Paradox to offer asset mods to console players as well as PC players. The publisher also says that using its own mo- its own platform from the start allows it to create an, in- an integrated in-game experience around mods. So maybe it'll be just as conf- convenient as Steam Workshop. I doubt it, but okay. Um, over 100 mods for the original City Skylines are currently available on Paradox Mods, although tens of thousands are available on Steam Workshop. So it's yet to, s- to be seen how the platform will handle sorting a full library of mods for the City Builder, which on PC should include a lot more than just additional assets. Other Paradox games do, uh, do have bigger Paradox Mods libraries. There are over 30,000 Hearts of Iron 4 mods on the platform, for instance. Mods for mod updates will download and install when the game is launched, and the system will support mod grouping according to dependencies and include a rating system. Paradox also says it has no plans for paid mods. The City Skylines 2 mod tools and its Paradox mod integration won't be quite ready in time for the October 24 release date, though. The in-game editor is in beta, Paradox said, and will launch sh- shortly after release. I... I kind of get where they're coming from as far as just like making a cross platform uh system that would work for consoles when that happens. I appreciate the forethought. I also don't fully understand why they wouldn't support Steam Workshop or Nexus mods. That oh, they would. Good. They would. Well, it, Steam maybe no, but you can always have unofficial mods uh from Nexus mods. I mean, that Nexus mods you just download and it just tells you how to install the mod into the game. Um I think it's a way. It's a good way to keep keep things safe, though. Um, the only reason why that there aren't many mods on Steam Workshop on uh, Paradox uh, mods is because they open that really late in the game for City Skylines. There are already tens of thousands available on Steam Workshop. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I think it's one of those things that gamers will be annoyed about, but will quickly get over if it's if it's painless, you know, if it's if it's seamless, and hopefully it will be. Um, I mean, there's lots of ways to mod the game. So, I mean, I know Nexus Mods is a, a mod hosting place as well. So it's not like it's impossible to mod it just because it's not on Steam Workshop. Yeah, and I would like to be. Here's the thing: I have uh, Slay the Spire, but I don't have it on Steam, so I don't have access. I play it on Xbox. I don't have access to those mods, and there's one big mod which I would love to try. Which is, you know, there's so many things in that mod that are cool. But I can't because I'm on console. So I I don't mind them if they want to do this so that they can incorporate, you know, mods. And, but here's the funny thing on Fallout 4. I, I seldom ever use any of this Fallout 4 mods on, you know, on Xbox or on PC either. So I, I don't know. I, I I only use mods when I desperately need it. The only, the only mods that interest me on Fallout 4 are the ones that kind of automate the building stuff so I don't have to deal with that. Because <laughs> I would rather just quest an adventure. Yeah. I just uh, ignore it mostly. <laughs> I wonder if they'll stick with this or if they'll change their minds down the line because I don't know. Steam Workshop is a highly supported platform. I doubt it. I doubt it. it I, I really doubt it. I think that um, the way they're doing this seems like it's not going to be that intrusive. As a matter of fact, I think it's it's trying to be as unintrusive as possible. Like I said. If it's a smooth experience, gamers will just shrug and say, okay. Um, I like the idea. Uh, that's the other thing is that they, they can curate uh, a lot better than Steam can. And it's one thing that Steam does not do very well is curate. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah. I mean, you can have all the ratings up the wazoo, but if the uh, game itself, you know, can suggest stuff to you that you might want. Uh, we'll see. Uh, the only thing that bothers me is that it sounds like City Skylines 2 is going to be very janky when it comes out next week. Yeah, I'm expecting a day one patch and a day two patch and maybe even a day three patch. Fortunately, it's on PC Game Pass, so I don't have to worry about money. <laughs> they, uh, this I felt like this was always going to be the case, though. I feel like City the the first City has also had kind of a janky launch. But um, either way, like... I don't know. This game is definitely going to be optimized over time and it's going to and whatever happens with it on day one is not going to be the is not going to be the kind of stuff we see on like day 30. Let me put it this way. A year from now, there's going to be certain people who are just going to be playing that game four hours a day. I might be one of them. (laughs) uh, It is one of those games in which you look at your watch and say, holy shit, that much time has passed. Yes. If I didn't have a dog and a spouse, I would probably uh, waste entire days on this. I, I mean, that's definitely see that. I mean, me and Scott can can empathize because uh, when I first played the Civ games, that's how it was with me. It's like mm-hmm. one more. I would turn. start I would start playing at eight o'clock, and I look at my watch, and it's five o'clock in the morning. So I'm excited. Like I I, I really, despite hearing about like, I don't know. I guess we're we're in an era where like. Day one patches are so common now. It it feels like whatever whatever we see on day one is like that was what they were trying to rush out the door. They had a they had they had a deadline to meet and they had to meet that and they had to get the game out. There's a lot of people who just want everything in one ecosystem. Like they just want everything in Steam and nothing else. Uh, one of the big news that we're not talking about is that Diablo 4 will be on Steam soon. It was previously only on Battle.net. And I have to wonder if Microsoft told Blizzard, put that shit on Steam, we're putting all of our games on Steam. <laughs> That's certainly possible. Also, um, I've watched a few videos from people who are, you know, Diablo, who are really into Diablo and Diablo 4. I mean, I'm into Diablo 2, so... Um, I'm, I haven't played Diablo 4 yet, but they keep on talking about how um, Diablo 4 is kind of dated, and there's stuff going on right now with Paths of Exile that's making that's making uh, Diablo 4 look, you know, ancient. Yeah, Paths of Exile has been going for a long time, and I think isn't it Paths of Exile 2 now? I don't know if it's too long. Well, I think I heard something about that actually. Um, but anyway, they had their new iteration anyway. 
Um, yeah. I don't know if they. I don't know if they uh, called it Paths of Exile or Paths of Exile Two. Oh, it is Paths of Exile Two. Okay. Yeah, it's two. So it came out. Oh no, I'm sorry. No, it, it, there is going to be a Paths of Exile, but it's coming uh, to. But it's coming out uh, next year in June. Yeah, uh, I I have friends that absolutely love the hell out of the Path of Exile games. Like that. That game has been kicking around for a while, and I. And I know that Path of Exile 2 is still a ways off, but like I know that I also know a lot of people that are just waiting on it because of how Diablo 4 has disappointed them. Whatever happened to that other uh, Diablo esque game? Um, it had like four, four, uh, three sequels come out for it. Uh, Lodestone. Torchlight. No. What? Yeah, Torchlight. I wonder whatever happened to Torchlight. They did. Uh, they did four. I know that, but it's like it vanished into the ether. The game changed hands for a bit. Oh. Like, the rights changed hands, yeah, and that'll whoever kill you. had it did a bad job on one of the games, and then it went back to the original. And I just don't think that they've... I think they've done a new version of it, but I don't think they've ever found the footing that they had back in the day. I don't know. Maybe I will jump into Paths of Exile 2 when it comes out next year. Oh, that's the other thing, is that Paths of Exile, for those you don't know, is free to play. And it always has been. Oh, it's on Xbox and PS4? I did not know that. It's actually on console. I never knew it was on console. And it's apparently been on console for a while since it's Xbox One and PS4. Interesting. Yeah. Anyways, take the last item there, Scott. Okay. Lies of P passes 1 million units sold. This from Shaq News. Lies of P was a surprisingly good twist on the Soulsborne formula, featuring an interesting adaptation of the story of Pinocchio into the game. Sorry. In, um, let me restart that. <clears throat> Featuring an interesting adaptation of the story of Pinocchio into the genre, and it seems to have paid off for NeoWiz, the developers have confirmed that Lies of P passed over 1 million copies sold, making quite a successful first outing for the new IP. NeoWiz shared words of Lies of P crossed million copies milestone on Lies of P Twitter this week. We would like to express our sincere gratitude to all the citizens of Krat. The celebratory tweet reads, Thank you for everyone who helped us uh, and accompanied us, and we hope to you join our future journeys as well. Liza P came out on September 18th, 2023, on PC, PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Xbox XS, um, a month ago. By the way, um, I saw a... Uh Games coming up thing, and there's going to be a Soulsborne game that's based on Robin Hood. <laughs> its main feature is that it's going to be up to four player co op. So who knows? Uh, maybe there'll be a, a Soulsborne based on Anna Karenina or based on uh, Bambi. You're Bambi, and you have to uh, fight the evil humans who are burning the forest. I don't know. Uh, this article is actually written by you, TJ, so why don't you expand on it? Yeah, Liza P is a good one. Like, uh, I had a good time with that game when I reviewed it, and uh, it was definitely an interesting twist on the genre because of, like, the way that you could mix and match weapons, taking the blades off uh, one thing and adding it onto the handle of another thing and getting different stats and different attacks out of it. Um. It's also just an odd and interesting adaptation of Pinocchio. Like, who would have thought that uh, Pinocchio could be the core of an interesting grimdark Soulsborne game? I don't know. Alice in Wonderland comes to mind. Well, not that's a... true. Oh, actually, you know what? It wasn't a Soulsborne game, but I can easily see them making Alice into a Soulsborne game. Yeah, so that'd be pr- kind of cool. Alice. Yeah, it wouldn't be American McGee. He just does uh, 3D platformers. <laughs> But, um, yeah, I think uh, we're getting into the point of uh, Soulsborns in which they're starting to take on all these weird uh, uh, themes because, uh, you know, not everybody wants to play in a Dark Souls slash Elden Ring slash, you know, that sort of, you know, sort, sort of fantasy setting. I mean, I know The Surge tried to put it in a science fiction setting and The Surge 2 was moderately successful. Uh, the people, I get... Here's the thing. I get the impression that Liza P is not a home run. It's more like a triple. And it seems like a lot of people say it's okay, but we'd love to see what the next Liza P will be like when they address all the uh, complaints about it. Yeah. Um, 
it's been an interesting thing to see. Like this is, and it's good to see like it do well because like there's a lot of risk in doing an entirely new IP nowadays, and uh, especially doing a new IP in a in a genre that is very that has very particular fans. Um, I mean, Lords of the Lords of the Fallen just came out, and that one's been getting a little bit of a little bit shellacked because of uh, performance issues. And uh, Lies of P, I think, didn't have really like during my review, I didn't see a lot of performance issues in that game. But uh, it's great to see that it got the recognition it deserves because it's a very interesting game. I think Lords of the Fallen is pretty decent too. But it's uh, having a lot of problems right now. (laughs) Yes. They they need to do some work on that one. It'll it'll come into its own once they can smooth that out, and I think that people will come around on it. It's hilarious, it though. It's hilarious. It's like they came out with this tweet, oh, by the way, the Xbox version is not going to be very good, so just stick with us on that one. Yeah. It's going to have frame rate problems. But then people are having frame rate problems with the PC and PS5 version anyway. Yeah. Um, You know what? Uh, Wolong Fallen Dynasty also came out, and there's a lot of people who wish that they that they had just worked on Neo 3. I mean, I love Neo. I wouldn't have I I wouldn't have minded that in the slightest. Have you played Wolong? Um, I have not gotten around to it yet. It's something I need to because I'm probably going to have to talk about it in our Game of the Year stuff. Someone described it as a wonky Neo 3. <laughs> but uh, I will say this. The first boss in, ne- in Wolong is the hardest one. It is, it is the epitome of a wake-up boss. Huh, interesting. And then all the other bosses are simple after you do him. It's like you you, you uh, stress yourself out so much trying to defeat that boss. It's like the rest of them are like, oh, yeah, huh, they're doing that. That's fine. But it's not like the first boss. So, um, yeah, it's interesting to see, uh, you know, and um, Game Pass certainly helped it both on PC and Xbox. I'm glad that they're giving... Uh, Game Pass is allowing people to try games that they might want to try, but they may not want to spend money on, you know, right away. Oh, there is another game that uh, came out today, and I'm I downloaded. I'm going to try that as well, and it is uh, uh, Tales of the Dragon uh, Ishin, which takes uh, Kazumi Kuryu and puts him in uh, in the Udo period of Japan as a samurai. You know, like a dragon Ishin, right? Yes. Okay, I'm just. Yes. It's like there's signs. They're like what? And I, I, I don't I haven't tried it yet, but I intend to. Mm. And I like the the direction they're doing with the Yakuza series. It's like they're doing a lot of experimentation now. Because I will say this, this is my dirty little. I do not like the Yakuza games, the straight up Yakuza games. I did like like a dragon with Ichi. That was fun. It was turn based. So you know. There's now uh there's now a yakuza for everybody. Yeah, and it's uh it's been really interesting how they've set up those uh like it I kind of it sucks what happened with Judgment because of uh the actor's agency getting involved in uh and in sort of not wanting them to use his likeness for anything beyond Judgment. And uh that's a real shame because those games were pretty dang fun. They were like a, they were like Phoenix Wright mixed into Yakuza. And uh, but I do love the I do love that uh, that that stu- like they've been doing a good job of branching out from just the regular action schlocky beat 'em up and doing crazy things with uh, the the turn based RPG style and. Uh, and still including that combat and still including those those characters and aging them and, and giving them continuing stories. Yeah. Like I said, um, it's interesting that we're, we're coming into a very interesting part of uh, the video game world. I mean, there's a lot of worry about, you know, losing physical copies. And hope, it's not going to happen in the 10th generation. It might happen in the 11th generation. We don't know. It feels like they've been pushing towards that because I know Starfield is digital only and the the, the next consoles are having oh, a ha- digital only version. Yeah. Well, the PS well they did, already did that with the PS5. There is a digital yeah. only version of the PS5, and uh, the Xbox Series S is also digital only. Um, 
it's funny that the new PS5 Slim is just mimicking what the Xbox 360 did and just have a slap-on hard drive. And you know what? If future consoles do that, in which you just have a slap-on hard drive, I'd be fine with that. I mean, not a slap-on hard drive. Slap-on disk drive. I wouldn't be... I wouldn't... I wouldn't mind that, you know? Give people an alternative. If they want to spend extra for the disc, you know, they just slap it on. Anyway, look for our show notes at GamingPodcast.net, along with this year's news and our gaming history articles. We enjoy your feedback. Send us comments on our blog at GamingPodcast.net. Also, this up at Facebook.com slash GamingPodcast. Subscribe to us on iTunes. Leave us iTunes comments. You can find me on Twitter X at Jonah Falcon. You can find me at Johnny Chose. You can find me at Charter Moore. And we will see you next week with a very pedestrian 701. Happy gaming, everyone. Have fun, be cool, play game, Joe.